Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I'm here today to do a book haul for the month of February. And really quickly before we get into it, because we have a lot to cover, my book hauls had been shrinking over time. When I first joined BookTube, they were pretty large and then over time they started to shrink. And then since December, I've gotten pretty large again. And honestly, I kind of blame the new library for this. I'll have a link to the chore where I show my new library off. But uh, honestly, we created a Pulitzer Prize section, so a big reason my recent book hauls have been so large is because I was uh, getting a lot of the Pulitzer books and a lot of Franklin Library editions of the Pulitzer books. But now I've also really been thinking about this space that I have in my library and how to use it and curating authors and books that I would like to have my shelf on my shelf doing a little bit of library building and that kind of thing, which is actually a lot of fun. And um, there are some books in here. There's only one book that is actually part of my Pulitzer Prize project. And then there are other ones in here that are sort of library builders for future endeavors where I might want to read every book that a certain author has written or just have them on my shelf for a while, things like that. I actually have the room to think about these things, which is a nice problem to have. I'm hoping things will normalize a little bit, but for now at least, there's another big book haul to deal with. So we're going to start with a Pulitzer Prize book, and I think in the future, for the purposes of book haul revisits, I'm going to separate out books from a Pulitzer Prize project because I decided along the way that I want to own copies of all of the books that have won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. So it serves a very different purpose than other books that I haul. So I think in the future, I'm going to not include them in book haul revisits, but they certainly can be included in book hauls. So the book that I hauled this month is The Overstory by Richard Powers, and this is thanks to Marsha Johansson. The reason this is thanks to Marsha Johansson is that she commented on one of my videos. I can't remember if it was the new library tour uh, but she commented with one of those super thanks where you can sort of send money in a comment. And she said that because she read this book, I think last year, and really loved it, and it was not on my shelf, she wanted to gift me a copy. And the, you know, the super thanks should be considered a, a gift of this. So I took that and I went out and got a copy of The Overstory by Richard Powers. I thought one of my local stores had a hardcover copy, but it turns out they didn't. But I was able to get this nice edition of the paperback as well. It is a very pretty paperback as well. So Thank you to Marsha Johansson. I really appreciate it. And because this is part of my Pulitzer Prize project and it is a Pulitzer winner, I am happy to have it on my shelf with all of the others. Thank you again. So this is from W.W. Norton and Company. I admit I did try to read this book when it was first published and I didn't finish it. I really liked the writing in the first half. I just didn't make it beyond that because it started getting weird. So let me read you what blurb it, the blurb online looks like, and we'll go from there. The Overstory, winner of the 2019 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, is a sweeping, impassioned work of activism and resistance that is also a stunning evocation of and pee to the natural world. From the roots to the crown and back to the seeds, Richard Powers's 12th novel unfolds in concentric rings of interlocking fables that range from antebellum New York to the late 20th century, timber wars of the Pacific Northwest, and beyond. There is a world alongside ours, vast, slow, interconnected, and resourceful, magnificently inventive, and almost invisible to us. This is the story of a handful of people who learn how to see that world and who are drawn up into its unfolding catastrophe. So the first section of the book is almost like short stories. You can see in the contents, part one is called Roots, and then you have Trunk, Crown, and Seeds. I did not make it very far into Trunk before I bailed on the book. But part one, Roots, it feels like short stories. And they're very beautifully written. Um, and then they start connecting. And they get weirder when you get to trunks. So that's where I bailed. So I need to make a good faith effort to finish this book as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. And I'm, I've heard so many really good things about it that I'm hoping I will like it better or at least get further along. So what I'm doing for myself is in situations where I've tried and failed to read a Pulitzer book before... Most of the time, I'm going to try by audio. I think with this one, because the writing is so beautiful, I will try the physical book again, especially since I have a nice copy of it now. Thank you to Marsha Johansson. So that is... 
the overstory. In all of my book hauls, I like to read a little bit from the opening just to give you a sense of what the book is. The first sort of story in the beginning is called Nicholas Hole. Now is the time of chestnuts. People are hurling stones at the giant trunks. The nuts fall all around them in a divine hail. It happens in countless places this Sunday from Georgia to Maine. Up in Concord, Thoreau takes part. He feels he is casting rocks at a sentient being, with a duller sense than his own, yet still a blood relation. Old trees are our parents, and our parents' parents, perchance. If you would learn the secrets of nature, you must practice more humanity. And that is The Overstory by Richard Powers. That takes us to Hawk Mountain, a novel by Connor Habib. I have seen some really interesting things about this book, and some, some people whose opinion on books I respect have talked about liking this book over the last year. And I had been thinking about reading it. I was a little curious, but I wasn't actively seeking it out. And then I saw a copy at my local used bookstore. So I picked it up. It's in really good condition. This is also published by W.W. Norton and Company. Here is the blurb that they have online. Single father Todd is relaxing at the beach with his son, Anthony, when he catches sight of a man approaching from the water's edge. As the man draws closer, Todd recognizes him as Jack, who bullied Todd relentlessly in their teenage years, but now seems overjoyed to have run into his old friend. Jack suggests a meal to catch up, and can he spend the night? What follows is a fast-paced story of obsession and cunning. As Jack invades Todd's life, pain and in intimidation from the past unearth knife-edge suspense in the present. Set in a small town on the New England coast, Connor Habib's debut introduces characters trapped in isolation by the expanse of woods and the encroaching ocean, their violence and expression of repressed desire and the damage it can inflict. Both gruesome and tender, Hawk Mountain offers a compelling look at how love and hate are indissoluble, intertwined until the last breath. Sounds really interesting, and it's a beautiful cover. Kind of reminds me of The Catcher in the Rye, but obviously it's not. And uh, let's do a little bit from the opening of this book. Part 1. Before Todd sees Jack for the first time, his eyes are closed. He's in class. Around him are the sounds of other people who don't want to be there. Students, the teachers in other rooms, cafeteria workers, custodians in the halls. They're all held together by this school at the top of a hill in Lanchester, New Hampshire, where nothing happens. Outside, the world is living out its rhythms. Wrens dart past the window, and a cloud dissolves in front of the sun. Todd is 17. It is the start of senior year. Just nine months between now and graduation, but still, it feels there's no end in sight. And that is Hawk Mountain by Connor Habib. Which takes us to The Life to Come and Other Stories by E.M. Forster. I was actually in my used bookstore the day I found Hawk Mountain uh, to just browse through the E.M. Forster section and see what they had. I found this, and it was perfectly timed because in February, the E.M. E. Forster read-along, I'll have information about that down below, I was reading short stories by E.M. Forster, and I have completely failed at that because I put this to the side to focus on a different book instead, and I was hoping I would get back to it. I might catch up to this in March, but everybody else has been going along with it, and... Uh, Hopefully, I will catch up. This edition is published by Avon. You can see it's a sort of vintage paperback of the book. And I kind of like these vintage looking books. So, there are 14 stories in this book spanning six decades from the first part of the century to the, to the late 50s. And four of the early stories did not find immediate acceptance and Forster dismissed them. Uh, basically, those stories could not be published in his lifetime because they dealt with homosexual themes. And that is another thing that makes this collection very interesting to me. So I will still read it at some point, even if I don't make it as part of the E.M. Forster read-along. Let's do a bit from the opening story of the book. Let me get past the introduction... And here is the first story, called Ansel. It's a cruel box, said the porter, who, beguiled by its moderate size, had hoisted it onto his shoulder and then hastily dumped it back on the platform. The weight's cruel. That'll need a barrow. He went and fetched one and wheeled the box and the bag across the line. That's packed very close. Yes, I replied. It's books. Books, he echoed in an injured voice for I had incautiously displayed twopence and twopence alone in the palm of my hand. I don't hold with books in the country. What you want is recreation and hair and exercise. 
That is the opening of the first story of The Life to Come and Other Stories by E.M. Forster. It's obviously the uh, project for the E.M. Forster read-along for February, as I mentioned, and I'm going to have to try to catch up to it at another point in this year. Next is an ARC that I have already read. It's Games and Rituals by Catherine Heine. These are short stories. They are very smartly observed and humorous, funny, sometimes a little bit too clever, but mostly uh, I, I, I think they're just observant and witty. And the they sort of follow games and rituals that we create for ourselves to keep things interesting, to keep habits going, to deepen relationships, and things like that, and lies we tell ourselves as part of that. And so it can be a very interesting book as well. This is going to be published by Kanaf on April 18th. So if you are interested in it, you could pre-order it at your local independent bookstore. I recommend Montana Book Company, but you, you feel free to choose your own. And uh, it will be released then. Uh, let's do a bit from the opening of the first story in the collection which is called Chicken Flavored and Lemon Scented. Colette has been a driving examiner for 12 years. She's 36, and yet it only occurs to her today that Ted Bundy had a driver's license. And that means that some driving examiner had taken him for a road test. Think about it. Some driving examiner had willingly clambered into Ted's VW Bug and driven off with him. Maybe the driving examiner had even been a woman. A woman who never knew she had ridden next to death, never knew she had docked death points for improper clutch control. Why has Colette never thought about that before? But she thinks of lots of things lately that she hasn't thought about before. And that is the opening from the first story of Games and Rituals by Catherine Heine. Something I've already read, so I have that going for me when it comes around to a book I'll revisit in the future. Next is another ARC from Knopf. It's In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. I talked about this one in my most anticipated books of 2023. I didn't feel like it'd be fair to include Games and Rituals because I have already read it. So the next one is also an ARC that was included in that video. I'll have a link to it down below. This will be published on March 7th, again by Knopf. So if this sounds interesting to you, again, feel free to pre-order a copy from your local independent bookstore. This book follows a student in the beginning years of World War I. He realizes that he has fallen in love with a male classmate of his, and he is afraid of those feelings. And he is inspired to enlist in the, uh, and join the front line of World War I in a desperate attempt to escape those feelings and what they mean and not deal with them. Unfortunately for him, the boy that he is in love with also enlists and follows him to the front line, as do many of their classmates. And once they are on the front line, obviously, you know, chaos and tragedy ensue because World War I was a mess. <laughs> And we can leave it at that. Uh, this was first brought to my attention in the Queer TBR Tackle or the EM Forrester read-along. I can't remember which. And it really caught my attention. Uh, I know Jen the Librarian read it and was not too enthusiastic about it. I'm hoping that because she's really knowledgeable about World War I. So she got tripped up in some of the facts. And I am not as knowledgeable about World War I. So maybe I won't have the same problem when I read it. I'm still very interested in reading it. Here's a bit from the opening of In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. Elwood was a prefect, so his room that year was a splendid one, with a window that opened onto a strange outcrop of roof. He was always scrambling around places he shouldn't. It was Gaunt, however, who truly loved the roof perch. He liked watching boys dipping in and out of Fletcher Hall to pilfer biscuits, prefects swanning across the grass in court, the organ master coming out of chapel. It soothed him to see the school functioning without him, and to know that he was above it. That is In Memoriam by Alice Wynn, which will be released on March 7th. And that takes us to the final ARC in this collection, again from Knopf. This one is actually published by now. It uh, was published on February 14th. It's On the Savage Side by Tiffany McDaniel. I have a copy of Betty right here on my shelf, and I really want to read that book. I have not yet. Similar to Betty, this takes... A true story and sort of novelizes it. This follows disappearance of women. It is inspired by the true story of the Chillicothe murders, a harrowing novel about six women who have gone missing and two sisters who could be the next victims. So it seems like it sort of plays with thriller 
aspects and suspense to tell a story about women who go missing. And unfortunately, that is something that is all too common in the world in the past and still today in the present. So I've heard that this is a very difficult read for that, but I would still like to get to it. I might read Betty first still, uh, but I am very interested in this one as well. And this is on bookshelves now. I have the ARC, but uh, it is out there for you to pick pick up. And actually, the book is dedicated to the Chillicothe Six victims. It lists them, their names, uh, and the dates they disappeared in the front. So that that is a nice touch. And here is the prologue. I want to start with chapter one. Let's do that. The first sin was believing we would never die. The second sin was believing we were alive in the first place. When a woman disappears, how is she remembered? By her beautiful smile, her pretty face, the drugs in her system, or by the Johns who all have dope breath and graceless desires. In Chillicothe, Ohio, there is the familiar quarrel, the same quarrel that is known through once pastoral fields where industry was made and generations were supported by grandfathers and fathers working in the paper mill until they came home at night to become the captains of the dinner table while our mothers were women of immortal hands who picked up our dropped prayers and answered them. That is the opening of On the Savage Side by Tiffany McDaniel. A very compelling opening, if you ask me. That takes us to an interesting, interesting, interesting find at my local used bookstore the same day I got The Life to Come and Hawk Mountain. It's Roots, The Saga of an American Family by Alex Haley. This is particularly interesting because, well, actually, let me read what it says online and then we'll talk about why that's really interesting for me. Based on... Off of the best-selling author's family history, this novel tells the story of Kunta Kinte, who is sold into slavery in the United States, where he and his descendants live through major historic events. When Roots was first published 40 years ago, the book electrified the nation. It received a Pulitzer Prize and was a number one New York Times bestseller for 22 weeks. The celebrated miniseries that followed a year later was a coast-to-coast -coast event. Over 130 million Americans watched some or all of the broadcast. In the four decades since then, the story of the young African slave Kunta Kinte and his descendants has lost none of its power to enthrall and provoke. So, first thing that's interesting about that is that it's based on Alex Haley's family history that is part of the lore of Roots. So, and then the second thing is that it won a Pulitzer Prize, but you have to put an asterisk on that, and nobody ever does. Because it didn't, what happens is people think that it won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. It did not. It was given a special citation by the Pulitzer board. So technically, this book did win a Pulitzer, but it's a citation, not a prize. And the reason, and why this is going to be such an interesting Pulitzer Prize deep dive when I get around to it, is that the running theory is that Roots was all set to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And then in the days leading up to the announcement of the prize, there were accusations of plagiarism and factual inaccuracies about the book and whether or not it actually is based on Alex Haley's family history or if he kind of made it up. I have not really looked into whether or not this is true yet, by the way. I am sort of waiting until I have the time to read the book as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. Because what ended up happening is no prize was given for fiction that year, but Roots was given a special citation. So the speculation is that Roots was going to win, and then when the this sort of controversy emerged in the days leading up to the announcement, the board pivoted, did not give it the prize for fiction, and gave it a special citation instead. So it's going to be a really interesting book for my Pulitzer Project. This edition of the book is published by Doubleday. And another thing that's really interesting about this is that this is a beautiful edition of the book. There is Alex Haley on the back. I used to have attitude about used books. I was worried that they were going to be dirty and all kind of things like that. I was very, I didn't even like library books because I was like, I don't know who's touched them. Now I find it fascinating because there's history in these books and you wonder who had them, who cared for them in the past. This was part of John R. Gertner Jr.'s library. He stamped it. He dated it February 9th, 1977. And one of the other things that's really interesting is there are newspaper articles about the book and Roots 
that were cut out of the newspaper and put into this edition of the book. This has the family tree. And that to me is fascinating because obviously I wouldn't have had access to these articles before. So when I do read this, I'm going to have additional resources from that. So thank you to John R. Gertner Jr., wherever you are, <laughs> and because you have unwittingly helped me out. And I, I, I cherish, cherish the fact that there are some personal touches in this edition of the book. So that takes us to some of the library curating. An author that I have decided I would like to have all of her books is Toni Morrison. So they had a nice copy of A Mercy at my local used bookstore in hardcover, and I picked it up. This is an edition from Knopf, and here is what the online blurb says. This acclaimed Nobel Prize winner reveals what lies beneath the surface of slavery, but at its heart, like Beloved, it is the story of a mother and a daughter, a mother who casts off her daughter in order to save her, and a daughter who may never exercise that abandonment. In the 1680s, the slave trade in America is still in its infancy. Jacob Vark is an Anglo-Dutch trader and adventurer with a small holding in the harsh north. Despite his distaste for dealing in flesh, he takes a small slave girl in part payment for a bad debt from a plantation owner in Catholic Maryland. This is Florence, who can read and write and might be useful on his farm. Rejected by her mother, Florence looks for love, first from Lena, an older servant woman at her new master's house, and later from a, the handsome blacksmith, an African never enslaved, who comes riding into their lives. It's a tiny little volume. I, I've heard good things about it. It's a beautiful cover as well. And here is a bit of the opening. Oh, it opens with a map. I love a book that opens with a map. And here we go. Don't be afraid. My telling can't hurt you in spite of what I have done, and I promise to lie quietly in the dark, weeping perhaps or occasionally seeing the blood once more, but I will never again unfold my limbs to rise up and bear teeth. That is the opening of A Mercy by Toni Morrison, an author who I would really like to have all of her books and read all of her books at some point. And I recently read a book by Edna Ferber called Fanny Herself, and I, was, I really loved it. I was a huge fan, and she quickly became an author. I was interested in as well. So I went to my local used bookstore, looked for copies of her books. They only had, well, they had four. They had a copy of Giant that was really beaten up in paperback. They had a copy of another paperback that was really old and not in great condition, but they also had two hardcovers, and I picked both of those up. First is Showboat. This is a facsimile of the 1926 edition of the book. So here's a bit of a blurb. Explore the peaks and perils of the great Mississippi River as three generations of steamboat theater performers tour their shows across North America in this tale of enduring love. Edna Ferber's charming novel follows the cotton blossom showboat from the 1880s through the glamorous jazz age of the 1920s. A family of performers dedicate their lives to bringing the magic of theater to the small towns of the Mississippi banks. This timeless tale is a story of love, hardship, racial prejudice, and the evolution of theater. Experience the transition from the Reconstruction era into the 20th century as technology develops and war darkens the everyday lives of struggling actors. So, Showboat was published, I think, in 1926. In 1927, it was adapted into a famous musical of the same name, and it was also adapted into a movie well, the musical was adapted into a movie, and uh, I saw the musical many times as a kid, but I have n never read the book, and now I would really love to. And I just love that this is uh, a facsimile of the uh, first edition from 1926, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Let's do a little bit from the opening of this book. Oh, I love this. It has like a cast of characters, which probably makes it really uh, easy to adapt for a musical. All right. Chapter one, Showboat. Bizarre as was the name she bore, Kim Ravenal always said she was thankful it had been no worse. She knew whereof she spoke, for it was literally by a breath that she had escaped being called Mississippi. Imagine Mississippi Ravenal, she often said in later years. They'd have cut it to Missy, I suppose, or even Sippy, if you can bear to think of anything so horrible. And then I'd have had to change my name or give up the stage altogether, because who'd go to see, serious, seriously, I mean, an actress named Sippy? It sounds half-witted for some reason. Kim's bad enough, God knows. And as Kim Ravenaugh, you are doubtless familiar with her. 
It is no secret that the absurd monosyllable with which comprises her name is made up of the first letters of three states, Kentucky, Illinois, and Missouri, in all of which she was, incredibly enough, born. And that is the opening of Showboat by Edna Ferber. I'm really looking forward to exploring Edna Ferber's literary output further. The other hardcover book that they had was Ice Palace, probably one of her lesser known books. This is about Alaska, the sort of taming of the territory and its march towards statehood and all of the controversies and compromises that were made as a result of that. It was originally published, I think, in 1958. By the way, uh, that edition of Showboat is published by Gramercy, and this is published by Doubleday, this edition of Ice Palace. I believe it was published in 1958, and this edition itself comes from 1958. Yeah, copyright 1958. Uh, I don't know if it's a first edition, but it is in great condition, and I am looking forward to reading it as well because it sounds fascinating. Here's a bit from the opening. Every third woman you passed on Gold Street in Bar Baranoff was young, pretty, and pregnant. The men, too, were young, virile, and pregnant with purpose. Each making his or her way along the bustling business street seemed actually to bounce with youth and vitality. Only an, an occasional old sourdough, relic dating back to the gold rush days of fifty years ago, waddled and wary as a turkey cock, weaving his precarious pedestrian way in and out of the frisky motor traffic, gave the humming town a piquant touch of anachronism. That is the opening of Ice Palace by Edna Ferber. I'm really looking forward to exploring her work even further. Now, that takes us to the big uh, bit of library building and curating that I did for an author, because I'm thinking at some point it would be really interesting to read all of the works of Louise Erdrich. She won a Pulitzer Prize for The Night Watchman. I would contend she should have at least had one Pulitzer Prize by that time, and The Night Watchman is probably not the book that she should have won for. It's more of a career achievement prize. But I think it would be really interesting at some point when I have the bandwidth to read all of the books leading up to The Night Watchman and use that as a framework for my Pulitzer Prize project deep dive of The Night Watchman. So I found some really beautiful hardcover editions of a couple of her books at my local used bookstore, and I cashed in all of the credit that I had at my local used bookstore to get these. I don't regret it, but... I have no more credit with them. The first one is the Beat Queen. Again, beautiful edition. I think some of the, these actually are first editions. I'm not going to go in for every single one. This one is not a first edition, but it is a sort of vintage cover of it. So this is a vibrant tale of abandonment and sexual obsession, jealousy and unstinting love. On a spring morning in 1932, young Carl and Mary Adair arrive by boxcar in Argus, North Dakota. Orphaned in a most peculiar way, Carl and Mary look for refuge to their mother's sister Fritzi, who with her husband Pete runs a butcher shop. So begins an exhilarating 40-year saga brimming with unforgettable characters. Ordinary Mary, who causes a miracle, seductive Carl, who lacks Mary's gift for survival, Sita, their lovely, disturbed, ambitious cousin, Wallace Pfeff, a town leader bearing a lonely secret, Celestine James, a mixed-blood Chippewa, and their daughter, her daughter, Dot. Theirs is a story grounded in the tenacity of relationships, the magic of natural events, and the unending mystery of the human condition. That's The Beat Queen by Louise Erdrich. This edition is published by Henry Holt. Let's do a little bit of the opening of the book, because that's what we do here. Here we go. Part one. Mary Adair. 1932. So that's how I came to Argus. I was the girl in the stiff coat. After I ran blind and came to a halt, shocked not to find Carl behind me, I looked up to watch for him and heard the train whistle long and shrill. That was when I realized Carl had probably jumped back on the same boxcar and was now hunched in straw, watching out the opened door. The only difference would be the fragrant stick blooming in his hand. That's the opening of The Beat Queen by Louise Erdrich, which takes us to tracks. I said I wasn't going to check all of them to see if they're a first edition. I think this one is. This is a first edition of tracks by Louise Erdrich. Set earliest in the time within the cycle of her prize-winning and best-selling books Love Medicine and The Beat Queen, tracks takes readers to North Dakota at a time when Indian tribes were struggling to keep what little remained of their land, featuring many familiar characters. All of her books feature many familiar characters. A beautiful edition of the book. And we're going to do a little bit from the opening of this as well. Chapter 1, Winter 1912. 
We started dying before the snow, and like the snow, we continued to fall. It was surprising there were so many of us left to die. That is the opening of Tracks by Louise Erdrich. And that takes us to the Bingo Palace. And actually, you know what? I said I wasn't going to do it, but let's just let's just do it and check. This is a first edition of the Bingo Palace by Louise Erdrich. And again, nice cover. It is the fourth novel in Erdrich's Love Medicine series, and it follows Lipshaw Morrissey as he is summoned home by his grandmother, Lulu Lamartine. He returns home to the reservation for the first time in years and finds himself in rapture of a woman named Shawnee Ray. The novel discusses themes of family and identity, and just those names will be familiar with you if you have ever read a Louise Erdrich book before. Here is a bit from the opening chapter one, The Message. On most winter days, Lulu Lamartine did not stir until the sun cast a patch of warmth for her to bask in and purr. She then rose, brewed fresh coffee, heated a pan of cream, and drank the mix from a china cup at her apartment table. Sipping, brooding, she entered the snowy world. A pale sweet roll, a donut gem, occasionally a bowl of cereal, followed that coffee, then more coffee, and on and on until finally Lulu pronounced herself awake and took on the day's business of running the tribe. That is the opening of The Bingo Palace by Louise Erdrich. I have two more Erdrich books. Next one is The Antelope Wife. And let's see if this one is a first edition. It is. And again, beautiful cover. There's a photo of Louise Erdrich on the back. Originally an important hunting ground for the Ojibwe, the city of Minneapolis draws from nearby reservations many Native people, people who infuse the city with a strong and ongoing Native presence as well as a potent Indigenous past. This story brings to life the people who live in or around this Midwestern city. And like a modern city itself, it portrays people of all backgrounds and is a mixture of vibrant cultures and ideas. But also like a modern city, it has an edge troubled by violence. Let's do a bit from the opening of The Antelope Wife. There are acknowledgments. Part 1, Chapter 1, Father's Milk. Scranton Roy. Deep in the past, during a spectacular, cruel raid upon an isolated Ojibwa village mistaken for hostile during the scare over the starving Sioux, a dog bearing upon its back a frame-board gun, enclosing a child in moss, velvet, embroideries of beads, was frightened into the vast carcass of the world west of the Otter Tail River. A cavalry soldier, spurred to human response by the sight of the dog, the strapped-on child, vanishing into the distance, followed and did not return." That's the opening of The Antelope Wife by Louise Erdrich. And the final hardcover book that I got, because I just think it'll be nice to have hardcovers of her work, is The Painted Drum. This, I do not believe, is a first edition, but let's check. And this is the most recent one. Oh, it is a first edition, and it's from 2005. While appraising the estate of a New Hampshire family descended from a North Indian agent, Faye Travers is startled to discover a rare moose skin and cedar drum fashioned long ago by an Ojibwe artisan, and so begins an illuminating journey both backward and forward in time, following the strange passage of a powerful yet delicate instrument and revealing the extraordinary lives it has touched and defined. Compelling and unforgettable, Louise Erdrich's The Painted Drum explores the often fraught relationships between mothers and daughters, the strength of family, and the intricate rhythms of grief with all the grace, wit, and startling beauty that characterizes this acclaimed author's finest work. I mean, sold. Right? All right, let's do a little bit from the opening of The Painted Drum, Part 1, Revival Road, Faye Travers. Leaving the child's cemetery with its plain hand-lettered sign and stones carved into the weathered shapes of lambs and angels, I am lost in my thoughts and pause too long where the cemetery road meets the two-lane highway. This distraction seems partly age, but there is more too, I think. These days I consider and reconsider the slightest of choices, as if one might bring me happiness and the other despair. There is no right way, no true path. The more familiar road, the easier I'm lost. Left and, and the highway snakes north, to our famous college town, but I turn right and am bound toward the poor and historical New England village of Stiles and Stokes, with its great tender maples, its old radiating roads, a stern white belfry, and utilitarian gas pump slash grocery. That is the opening of The Painted Drum by Louise Erdrich. So it's, it's a lot of books I brought into my library in the month of February, but I'm really happy with all of them. I feel very 
interested in reading them, I'll be happy to have them on my shelves and all of that. But let me know if you've read any of these books, if you have feedback on them, if there are other recommendations you would make to me based on my interest in these, let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.